Welcome to Municipal Month on the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today because not only is she the mayor of her community, but she is my very first guest for the territory of the Northwest Territories, and that is Mayor of the City of Yellowknife, Rebecca Alti. Your Worship, welcome to the show, and thanks for being my uh, inaugural guest from the Northwest Territories. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me. I am honored to uh, to be able to be the inaugural guest and hopefully uh, not the last. I hope so, too. Um, I have started my interviews with uh, municipal, federal, provincial senators, all elected officials the exact same way. So you're no exception to this question. Mayor Alti, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? I... I guess it must be from my parents, but it just always felt, you know, like growing up, my my mom was a, a big volunteer, particularly in soccer. And, you know, it started with myself playing and then my sisters and she was there to, to help organize. And, you know, Yellowknife's a, a bit of a small town. So uh, if something wasn't started, she was there to, to get it going. And I think um, just seeing how how all it takes is one person, an idea to get it going and then to get other people on board to be like, oh, this is possible. And yes, I want to help out and, and get this to grow. So probably from my mom, it, it's probably one of those cliche answers, but but it's so true. I, I love Cliches these cliche answers. That's, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a reason they exist. Exactly. You, 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 you. You decided to serve your community in the political realm, and I want to make sure I get this right here. In 2012, you put your name forward to be a City of Yellowknife councillor. You won that election and then were re-elected. You could have chosen many different fields to give back to your community and serve your community, whether it be through sports, whether it be through nonprofits, but you chose the political realm in 2012. What was that decision based on? Yeah, it was, uh, maybe it's ironic, but I'd been involved with soccer. I was a big coach and organizer, and I was kind of, quote unquote, tired of the politics of uh, sports. So I decided to get into politics. Um, and uh, in 2012 was, uh, you know, an election and a friend was putting her name forward and she asked if I'd be her campaign manager. And I was like, I have a, you know, a background in communication. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll help out. I don't, I don't know what's involved in this campaign manager business, but there happened to be a campaign school for women that the Federation of Canadian Municipalities was putting on. And so I attended it. And one of the questions was, you know, um, who here's running? And I think there was about 10 women in the room and none of us put our hands up and it was like, it's great. You're all here to help out, but we need women to actually step forward. And, and I never really considered it before. So I think it was that the, the kernel, the seed of, oh, this actually sounds like something I might be interested in. And, um, you know, as the election approached, I, I didn't see enough candidates that, that I felt aligned with, that I felt were like, had the same values as me. So I uh, decided to put my name forward. And after, you know, I went to get into it, I, I knew I interacted with the city from that soccer perspective, you know, renting facilities and knew that stuff but um yeah once you get in the role and you're learning more about zoning and garbage and I was like actually I love this stuff so um there's a lot to learn and if you love being busy and talking to different people then it's a great great role for you I want I want to go back to your friend here that you were the campaign manager for. Oh, no. how, how was that conversation to say, while I would love to still be as your campaign manager, I'm actually going to put my name forward as well. So we're going to be running against each other. I'm going to be your competitor. Yeah, you know, she was, uh, <laughs> luckily we both got elected and uh, she said, we might need to take a break for the month that we're campaigning. We used to walk together like every morning. And uh, so I was just like, okay, fair enough. We'll take a little break for a month. And then we both got elected and spent two terms on council and we're still great friends, but could have gone bad, I guess. So I want to go back to that 2012 election because I want to learn about yourself before I learn about your community. And I want to uh, educate my listeners and viewers about who you are. I want to go back to that 2012 election 
you can fight uphill battles with that election because it's your first election you're on the ballot you don't know where the chips are going to fall you have an idea you think you're going to win you hope you're going to win but not until the official results or the unofficial results are announced on election night do you really get a sigh of relief for you election night in 2012 when you were confirmed to be the next city councillor designate for the city of Yellowknife, what was that feeling like for you Oh, you're giving me butterflies in my stomach again. Uh, it was really exciting. I, you know, I we put the attached the computer to the um, TV screen, so I had a, you know, I kept it small. I only wanted some close friends because, yeah, it, it can go one of two ways: either you win and that's awesome, or you lose and you you pick yourself up and you've learned. And um, but I didn't want to. You know, some people do it in public and it was just like, you know, I want to do it in the comfort of my own home and be a bit more private. But yeah, it was it was really exciting seeing the results come in. I was polling well um, early on in the night. So it was like, oh my gosh, I think I think I've done it. Um, so it was, it was pretty exciting. And then, and then <laughs> you show up to orientation and you go, holy Moses, what have I, uh, what am I in for? Because and I look at it right now, we've got um, a lot of new candidates running. We're in the midst of an election. It'll happen October 17th. And um, you don't know what you don't know. You put forward these platform ideas. You're like, this is what I want to do. And then you show up on the first day. You're like, okay. Um, and besides that stuff, I'm also going to have to do ABC all the way to Z. So yeah, big learning curve, but it was definitely exciting. I, I want to talk about that moment, about that orientation, because you go from butterflies to the weight and responsibility of your community on your shoulders, your neighbors, your family members, your, the people you play, so your kids play soccer with, you are now going to be influencing their life because you will be fixing the roads, cleaning their roads, picking up garbage, charging them for tax dollars and property taxes. How much of a responsibility was that for you? Because I can imagine as someone, as you said, really got into politics. And I, I say this with all sincerity, relatively quickly because you went to a conference and then you were elected official. So how much responsibility and weight was on your shoulders once you started to get into the nitty gritty of what actual municipal government is? Yeah, it was... I always have, you know, um, probably the hardest judge on myself. And so those big expectations and really want to make sure that I do my due diligence. And so it is that it was that big learning curve. But um, I think it was in grade five when I wasn't doing so well in school and I had a parent teacher interview and I had to ask, starting from then, three questions a day. And it couldn't be, could, can I go to the bathroom? Um, and that really got me into the life of asking questions when you don't know something and how often somebody else is like, oh, thank you for asking that because I was embarrassed to ask. But like stuff like mill rates, which is how taxes get set and it means the split between how much a commercial gets paid or pays and how much a residential. And so you're like walking in like, what does this mean? What are the some of the things I have to consider? So I think um, it was I, I knew we had big decisions and I, I felt it um, and also just a big commitment to, to learn and the staff were great too. It's, you know, take some time, ask questions. There's no stupid question. And um, we're here to, to support you with our professional opinion. And then you, you add your political uh, take on it. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot to learn, even the process of, you know, I want to make this change in the Park. what's the right way to do this and what are three readings of a bylaw and was it overwhelming for yourself was it overwhelming because you're, you're you're making it sound like it it was a daunting <laughs> task because you and i and i say this with all respect to people who are listening right now most people don't know how municipal government works and i will be honest with that because it's not the one that you're watching question period or oral questions and you're seeing the politicians battle it off you're you're literally listening to someone talk about garbage for four hours and go okay we're going to change the pickup date from seven o'clock to eight o'clock and that's what the municipal government and it, there's there's some better parts of municipal government as well but that's how it can be i yeah. want to ask 
was it daunting for you because it seemed like you might not have been aware of the the pace that municipal government was at yeah i think my what i had on my side was my curiosity um internet is your best <laughs> friend as well to be like what are other places doing in this regards um and then yeah just really making sure that i gave myself enough time to do my homework and to ask all those questions. And if you need a bit more time before the vote to, to just stop and ask for that. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a lot to learn. And um, it's now 10 years later and I, I actually have to remind myself of how much people don't know about the process and I'm trying to, to simplify it. So when people show up, um, and, and speak to an issue, you're like, okay, thank you for your input. And these, this will be the next step with it because we're not gonna vote on it tonight. It's, it's in this stage of it. Because a lot of times people come um, and they kind of want to be three steps ahead. And uh, like, if we're talking about, you know, transferring land to somebody and they'll want to talk about what's the zone of that land gonna be in five years time. So, you know, really taking the time to walk people through it and just trying to remind myself of um, how much I've learned and how to try to break it down to plain language. Are the people of Yellowknife engaged? I, I've talked to many municipal councillors and mayors across this country, and some have said their, their population may be engaged with municipal politics, whether it be going to council meetings, whether it be being involved, whether it be getting involved on boards and committees that the cities and towns have. But are the people of Yellowknife in, uh, engaged in knowing what's going on at City Hall, do you find? I think it's always tough because everybody likes to think the government moves slow. And I find municipal governments move so fast. Like every single week we have a meeting. Every single week we're voting on stuff. And so um, and it's tough to be engaged on every single issue. You know, you're like, just got to try to make dinner and get the kids to hockey in time and, and not, you know, and that's that is why people elect counselors is to do that part of the job so that they don't have to do um, the nitty gritty. And, and because decisions are so linked, you know, like if you want to talk about, let's build a new suburb. Oh, okay. Great idea. More housing. Yay. Oh, but the flip side is it might actually increase taxes because we're going to have to snow plow a new road and pick up more garbage. And um, so I do think residents are engaged on the really big topics but some of the smaller stuff is, is probably like, yeah, you guys have it under control. We're not going to come out to speak to whatever issue. Policy um, Y about Park A or something like that. It's very, yeah, yeah understandable. I want to turn but back. It's also like the, the interesting like um, engagement on our flags and proclamation policy. We had some more engagement than we did at budget time that year. So it's kind of like that really tangible versus sometimes budget is, ah, oh, you know, I'm not good with numbers. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not what you, you don't have to do numbers. Just tell me what your priorities are. Do you think we're doing enough? Would you want to spend a bit more on trails? Would you want to spend less on trails? Should we make it, uh, you know, reduce the fee to use the hockey arena, but pay more in taxes? So yeah, just kind of like general comments is always helpful for counselors. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it briefly beforehand, and I want to just put a clarification note. So the uh, elections in the city in, in the Northwest Territories, the municipal elections in the Northwest Territories are happening on October 17th. This episode is airing a week later. So th this question is going to be a little bit redundant as it airs, but I want to ask it anyway, because it goes along with engagement in your community. Municipal elections usually bring out a lot of new voices, a lot of unique uh, voices to uh, council and it brings a lot of different perspectives to debates and uh, people on the ballot. The, these are the moments because you have been acclaimed as the next mayor, as the reelected mayor, I guess I can say, uh, for the city of Yellowknife, where you get to sit down and listen to these different unique perspectives, because not all of them will be, not all these candidates will be sitting around that council chambers with you. So is it, a, is it sort of a different perspective from your last campaign in 2018, where you were running against people, where you're now going to be able to sit down and go, oh, 
candidate X and candidate B have this issue, and I didn't think about this issue, and candidate Y and candidate Z have this issue, I didn't think about this issue. So is it a different perspective for you as someone who has been acclaimed as mayor to listen to the council candidates talk about the issues that they're bringing forward? Yeah, so this is my fourth election, um, and each one I feel is like just a little different. And so, like you said, you know, this time have that have more opportunity to kind of sit back and and listen to what people are saying. And um, the one thing I think is because again, there's a lot of new folks running, um, hearing stuff that actually the city's already doing. So clearly, we're not communicating that well. Um, and so, how can we, you know, make a change there? Uh, there's also a couple big decisions we made earlier this year that will be carried over to the new council and just a, a good reminder that we'll have to do we'll have to do some orient well clearly we're going to do orientation but you know getting people up to speed on all these big files because you are drinking the the fire hose it's just getting slammed at you as you start but again municipal government's moving so fast if we don't continue these files we miss out you know like one's going to be a federal project and if we're like well, let's take another year and, and take a look at it. It's like, we lost it. Federal government's funding's gone. That project's over. Um, the future of Yellow Knife's done or whatever. So it's, um, yeah, how can, I, how can I get the information prepared to, to get folks up to speed fast enough to be able to make educated decisions? Because you know, the last thing we want is A, somebody to not feel comfortable and like two years later regret their decision. Um, or the flip side, like vote down a project and be like, oh, that I wish I'd voted a different way. So yeah. there's one, one last area I want to talk about in, the, the, in this segment before we move into the city of Yellowknife as a whole. And that is the work and personal life, because as a municipal uh, government official, a mayor or a counselor, you are the front line of the politics that people deal with. If you go to the grocery store, people are going to know who you are and they will stop you and probably ask you questions about X, Y, or Z policy. Now you've been there for 10 years since 2012. So you probably have been able to adapt to it, but is it challenging for yourself to balance personal life versus public life in a small community or in a city like Yellowknife? Yeah. And it was really interesting. And I read, um, read a blog by Christina Benti before becoming mayor. And um, she talked about how, you know, once you're mayor, they put you up on this pedestal. And, and I did feel it right away it was like, there was a difference between Rebecca Alti, the counselor and Rebecca, or Rebecca Alti, the mayor. Everybody just thinks the mayor can do everything. And, you know, like Rebecca, I lost my, my license, my driver's license and I got to fly. And I'm like, well, that's the territorial. You got to go to DMV and try to get a new one. Um, but it can be, I think, certain weeks are harder than others. You know, you dealt with really tough issues and, you know, there'll be a Friday night and there's an event and I'm like, that's the last thing I want to do. I'm, I love people, but at the same time, I need a bit of time to myself to recharge. So, um, yeah, definitely over the past four years, well, <laughs> three of my four was in COVID. So that was also an un interesting thing, but I think it's important to, to be aware of what recharges you. And I know that for me, it's making sure I get my daily walks a day and um, cleaning my house is, it sounds funny, but it's, it's a lot of work that I do is going to be, the proof's going to be in the pudding 10 years from now, we're going to see success then where I can like clean my house and be like, yeah, I did that all by myself. And um, so just knowing what, what can kind of um, make sure that your mental health is in, in check. And because it can be, can be a lot you've got some some really hard issues it's the hardest thing I think is when issues are outside of my control you know hearing about people getting evicted and the city doesn't have uh any housing programs so it's I, I hear their concern and I work to address it but I'm not going to be able to find them a house tomorrow that's that's tough how do you deal with that? Because I, I know that you talked about going away and decompressing, whether it be vacuuming or cleaning your house. But I, 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 I've heard stories on my show and interviewed people who are struggling and it, it, it wretches me. And you hear it on a regular basis, probably on a more regular basis than most people. 
how how does it not affect you? And I, I mean that with respect because I can imagine like your mental health needs to be a top priority in a position like that. Yeah, I think some days it does. You know, like if I'm if I'm having a because it's tough. Like sometimes I have stuff in my personal life, and all of a sudden this like compounds on top, and you're like, okay, today's a really tough day, and um, just recognizing what's what's in your control. You. And all you can do, you're one person, you, as long as I'm putting one foot in front of the other and trying to make the right change is all I can do. I, I, if I put that unrealistic expectation of we're going to solve everything in four years or I'm going to solve everything this week, um, that's when I think I get the collapse. But some days it's tough and, you know, trying to get counseling if, if it's available is something that I want to try to do more of next semester or next term um, just to make sure that I'm keeping myself ready to tackle that big issue again tomorrow because it's not going to go away. Even if I solve that one person's homelessness problem, there's 300 or 400 people right behind them here in Yellow Life. Well, hello. This is your friendly host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I have some big news for you. I am pleased to announce that our show has partnered with Strategic Steps Incorporated to launch a brand new show on October 19th. The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work is a new show with a focus on local governments. Each episode, we will discuss the biggest stories from local governments and we will have a roundtable discussion on issues facing local governments today. Follow the new show by searching The Political Trenches on all social media platforms. We are looking forward to discussing local governments and heading into The Political Trenches. I want to turn to our second segment, and that is the city of Yellowknife. And before I start this segment, I want to preface this because we've already got complaints from other past interviews of people reaching out to us saying, how do the how does this person believe that this is the biggest issue? It's not. The city is not dealing with this issue. This is a conversation between the city of Yellowknife mayor and myself. This is her opinion. This is not a direction or a motion or a policy at council. This is her opinion. I need to keep on saying that because I keep on getting emails from some reason. Mayor Alti, you are heading into your second term. By this time of airing, a new council will probably have been elected, uh, might have been sworn in, depending on when you swear in your councillors. What is the biggest issue that you believe, in your opinion, is facing the city of Yellowknife into the future right now? It's an interesting one because um, there's kind of two things. There's the, the corporation, which we call the, the city of Yellowknife, and that's the stuff that we have control over. That's our fire and ambulance and water and sewer and rec facilities. And then there's like what the community is facing, which is stuff that's, you know, homelessness and mental health and addictions, which, you know, the city has got, got to play in, in, but with all the other orders of government. Um, so on the, the corporation side, I think it's, you know, making sure that Financially, it's going to be tough coming years. You know, inflation impacts residents just like it impacts the city. And so, you know, we we don't want to do tax increases, but at the same time, if we don't raise our revenue to cover the inflation of of heating our buildings, um, then we've got to cut a service, and people don't all, don't want to cut a service. So, I think a lot of at the corporate side is the service levels and making sure that. We're delivering the right services at the right level that people can afford. And then in our community, we've got, um, which makes it, again, a compounding difficult for um, finances, is the closing of one of the diamond mines will happen in 2024. And that's 3% of our working population works at that mine. Um, three or 30, sorry. Three. Okay. Three. Just the one, two, three. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. I, I, yeah. I heard I, you broke up a little bit. And I thought you said 30. So I just wanted to clarify oh, that. Oh boy. That would be, <laughs> yeah, I, would even, I wouldn't even talk about our corporation <laughs> problems. I would just talk about the community ones. Um, but you know, that, that has an impact on uh, the economy, the number of residents staying, but then we have opportunities like um, Aurora college is, is here in town and the government's looking to make it into a polytechnic and have a full campus. And so that brings jobs that, you know, you can't transition from the diamond mines necessarily to working at the college university, but it's still jobs. 
Um, homelessness and affordable housing continues to be an issue. Per capita, Yellowknife has more homeless people than the city of Vancouver. So the city of Vancouver has more people who are homeless, but per capita, we have a higher end. We've got minus 40, so that continues to be an issue. And um, and if just having housing is a challenge right now. I'm hearing employers can't get people because there's nowhere for people to live. Um, so that's a big one. And then mental health and addictions continues to be a big struggle. And we don't have, um, you know, knock on wood and thank goodness, uh, an opi opioid problem, but alcohol and, and other drugs are a big problem. And we see, we still see it spilling out on lateral violence and on our streets. So lots of really big, complex, interconnected problems that, you know, again, everybody's got to be federal, territorial, municipal, indigenous, private sector, NGOs, residents, all like working on it together, pulling in the right direction. Will we solve in four years? No, but we've got to make sure that we're like making progress, trying to address it. So what does making progress look like? Because at the end of the day, you need a step one, right? Step one is always the hardest step because you never know where you should start. And getting people at the table is great. And getting the federal government, the territorial government, NGOs, the indigenous communities to, at the table to talk about this is great, but you need step one. So for you, what would be the perfect step one to say, okay, let's try to fix housing first. Let's try and fix mental health and addiction first, because you just gave me a like grocery list of things that are, you believe are issues. And I understand because there is a lot of issues going on in this world, but you have to, you kind of have to pick and choose, don't you? And say, okay, which one are we going to have to start with first to try to fix this? So that way the trickle down effects will get this one, this one, and this one also on the radars as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think what like using data more effectively. So one of the things is, we have a, an apartment here in town and I think a th half of the leases are owned by public housing. And um, so there was issues happening. And, um, you know, so everybody was like, that building is bad. Well, it's not the whole building that was bad. When stopped and looked, there was 30 incidents in one month. One person was causing 11 of them. Another person was causing 11 of them. And there was a handful of other people. What do those two people need? Instead of saying like, this is out of control. Two people need support. What do they need? Um, and one of the things that's worked in other places is what they call situational tables. Um, we're kind of like a crisis response team. And so that's pulling together, like you said, everybody in the tent and saying, um, you know, the police have had an engagement with Joe four times this week. Something's up. And what can we do to, to provide support? So it would be great to have the territorial government and, and others um, get these situational tables up and running because they have been successful in the past. And, um, and in, you know, other data is, is in housing, like how many units does it take to address the affordable housing? And CMHC recently did a study um, for Southern Canada where they identified that. They were like, you know, if Ontario wants to hit affordable housing, which is 30% of people's incomes, this is how many they need. This is this is the cost that it's going to have to be, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I met with CMHC recently. It was like, hey, we want that data. We want it here in the <laughs> north. And so that it's it's also easier for people to understand that, um, you know, why are you building this apartment building? Um, well, not us personally, but why are you allowing this apartment building to get built in this area? It's like, well, we need 30 units to address it or 600 or whatever it may be. So I think really um, trying to find the right data sources to actually find solutions instead of just like throwing our hands up and being like, well, this is impossible. We're never going to solve it. Is it easy uh, because you are the capital of the Northwest Territories. So the premier sits there, your MP, I'm assuming has an office there as well. Is it easier for you as a city and especially the capital 
to have these conversations than say your rural counterparts who are not always in the capital sitting or meeting with the premier? Is it easy for you to have these conversations? And I'm not trying to be disrespectful to the challenges that you face, but it must be a little bit of a weight off your shoulders that you don't always have to be driving four hours to go meet with the premier and you can call her up or call up uh, um, uh, MP McLeod and say, let's have a conversation then can we do it tomorrow over coffee? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, MP McLeod's actually in Fort Providence, but. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I apologize. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah, so for Providence, for those who are li- listening, it's about a four-hour drive away, which is like <laughs> huge in our our uh, <laughs> especially in, our, in minus in forty trip. weather. I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but to your point, um, I think Yellowknife, like a lot of places, um, when you do approach, it's kind of like, well, but you're the capital and you get everything, and um, you get so that. Sometimes it's, do you get that oh, feeling? For sure. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely, and I'm always like, well, we get all the problems, and um, we don't always get all the solutions. So, <laughs> but it is uh, one thing I've loved about COVID is being able. It's now more acceptable to have Zoom meetings, and so you know, it's it's not a case of me flying to uh, Ottawa to meet with Minister Hussein, Minister of Housing. It's hey, can we can we jump on a Zoom call, which is different than um, a phone conversation. I think to to be able to have that, be able to see somebody's expression. So um, I've definitely found the COVID made it acceptable to have Zoom meetings, and then really pushing for them forward. Um, but yeah, definitely the one thing I would say that we benefit most is that the deputy ministers and a lot of the bureaucrats are in Yellowknife. So it is easier to have engagement from our staff to staff perspective versus um, in the communities. So, no, I, I recognize. um, It's a double-edged sword that you have, right? Yeah. 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 (laughs) And then it's like, well, we can't give you prior or like look like it's a bias. And yeah. But I do think more things like when it comes to homelessness, it's got to be dealt with at the territory level, like having a territorial plan to end homelessness, because the more that Yellowknife does, the more people are going to move here because we've got resources to provide support. And so I think right now to have, there's 33 communities in the Northwest Territories, each of us to have a housing plan, it just, it's not working. We've got to have more of a, that bigger territorial look. You've mentioned Pandora's box a few times here, and I want to open it up here and play in that for a few seconds, and that is COVID-19. We are, and I say this knowing that people are still sick, knowing that people are still getting sick from COVID-19, but it seems like we can see the light at the end of the tunnel of the global pandemic of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Before I ask the second question, I'm going to ask the first question, and that is, how did your community handle it? How did Yellowknife get through the global pandemic? Was it easy? Was it challenging? Or uh, did people respect the uh, governments and the health officials and the science and the doctors' uh, recommendations when it came to socially distancing and all that? Yeah, I think our community did well. Um, I don't think it was easy. I don't think it was easy anywhere. And I think um, a lot of mental mental health challenges arising from not being able to go see friends and family down south, um, the difficulties of leaving to be with a, a loved one who may be sick and then coming back. Cause we had, um, if you came back, you had to isolate for two weeks before you could leave your house. Um, so our restrictions were, were severe and we had a, a couple of outbreaks and it really, it, it can it really impacted like per capita. It's a couple times during COVID the Northwest territories was, the worst in North America, um, because it can just like rip through our communities. Um, However, um, not many people passed away uh, because we had some really strong restrictions. And so by the time COVID really came to the Northwest Territories, a lot of us had been vaccinated by then. But um, yeah, definitely tough. You know, we've got a big tourism industry and that's been closed for, for two years. And then when it opened again here in March, it was like, whew, the floodgates have been open since then. 
Well, we're going to be talking about tourism in the next segment and the, la the last segment, which is tourism. But I want to finish on this uh, in this segment with this question. You have given me your opinions on what the issues that are facing the city of Yellowknife. Now, if I go and take a survey of your community right now, I guarantee you I will hear a grocery list from every single one of your residents, whether it be a pothole, whether it be a uh, road crack or whatever, they have their issues that they believe are the most important because that's who they are and that's what they believe is the most important. How do you see yourself balancing that? Because I'm assuming after 10 years, you have learned to say no quite often and quite regularly and do it in a nice way, a political way. Um, how have you been able to take what the community has told you and pick the winners and the losers at the end of the day? Because you have to then to say, OK, this pothole is an issue. This pothole isn't one right now. Maybe two, two years from now, it might be a bigger issue, but we can't fix it now because of our budget constraints. How has that balance of picking the ish, the projects that you need to work on that are issues for your residents? Yeah, no, I'm pretty ruthless about trying to streamline <laughs> stuff. And uh, love it, love it, Mayor. You know, one thing we had was uh, the RCMP used to come and provide a monthly report to council, and it was just like their stats for the month. And I was like, the, the municipality has no relationship with like it's there's no contract with the municipality it's territorial level and so it's like I appreciate hearing the stats but we need to focus on our core business and so if we take 15 or even 20 minutes of our meeting to do that we're taking that from something else so really making sure that we're focused on our core business first and then, um, you know, when it's lobbying or advocacy, it's really focusing on those priority areas, which, you know, comes down to housing, mental health and um, addictions and the economy. Um, and then it's also having conversations with people. So like when people come and they want a new dog park or they want um, the arenas to be open 12 months a year because we close down in the summers, it's like, okay. Um, from a service level perspective, let's talk about it. Are you willing to pay more to have that? And most of the time it comes back, no. So then you're kind of like, okay, uh, issue addressed. Um, because at the end of the day, we have to start realizing that taxes is our collective, everybody's throwing money in and we're sharing the cost. And so, you know, I can't personally afford to have a fire department or fire protection for my home all by myself um, that's why I chip in and all of us have this fire protection service same with I can't economically provide my own clean drinking water so I chip in about a bunch of money with all my other residents in the community and we have clean drinking water so I think once we can start to really have more conversations about I don't like taxes and start having more conversations of, I don't want my taxes to pay for this, and I want my taxes to pay for that. Uh, yeah, really breaking that idea of like, you know, the quote unquote city with all of our money. Um, it's not a being that gets up, goes to work, earns a revenue. It's, it's your money together. And do we want to collectively pay for that service? Or should it be somebody else? Like, should it be a personal responsibility of somebody? It, it always strikes me. I come from the municipality, municipal world as well. I was communications and marketing for a small town in northern Alberta. And I can tell you that people are often on social media complaining into the void of social media because they want their voices heard. And I say that with respect to all people and everyone has the right to complain about whatever they want to. Just sometimes I can mute them. Um, when you see that, when you see people complaining and complaining often about city services that are being cut or redistributed or changed, what do you say to that? Because you are the mayor, you're the one who is at the end of the day who is responsible for what goes on at council. You are one vote. It is a very one vote out of however many councillors you have. Uh, but they look at you and say, why aren't you doing more to help us in, with the tax dollars that you have? Because I saw when I was a municipal employee, 
well, you spent $80,000 on this. No, we spent $4,000 on it. You're just getting 80,000 because you went and you got a quote from some friend of yours who said 80,000. So how do you balance back about the miscommunication in your community, if there is any? Well, it's, <laughs> it is the toughest one um, because I, I, I'm not much of a big, I'm not much of a social media user. Just personally, I, you know, have my professional, I've got my Facebook page and I've got my Instagram, but I don't spend my days on it because I'm actually busy. And, um, and you know, I could get be sucked into down the rabbit hole of, of these issues. And then there's also the whole, like, is it this, is this the vocal minority or is this the majority? Because then once you're out in public and talking to somebody away from the keyboard warriors, all of a sudden, like, life's fine. Life's rosy. So, and the keyboard warriors are usually the ones who are, everything's rosy when they see you in public as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. I'm like, is that the same? Did someone hack you? Like, I don't, I don't get it, but okay. Um, It is the struggle and there's no perfect, I, I haven't figured it out yet because the other thing is that, so, you know, polls have shown that residents don't trust government. So then when government goes and tries to like correct information, it's like, well, you would say that. And you're like, but it, well, I would say that because it's true. And like, you know, I try to include source documents and nobody wants to click on it and read it, but. Nobody wants to uh, read anything. If, unless it's 240 characters on Twitter, they don't care. They I read that with read respect. The title. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, so it's, it's, it's challenging, like, you'll talk to the media and try to be have um because other the other thing is that like these are issues are big and so you know the whole well i don't want my taxes to increase because they increased last year and i didn't see anything for it and you're like well actually (laughs) there was x y and z and once you have a conversation like most of the time people are like right right yeah um i understand (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I try to have those opportunities. I was doing a kind of pre, oh no, it was during COVID. I managed to find a COVID compliant way to do it, but have lunch with the mayor and it was in the summer and we could do it outside. So, wow. and it was an opportunity, no set agenda. It's just like, hey, come ask questions. And um, so the first group was really big and kind of after that, it was it was a bit smaller, but it's like to try to gain that trust. And, and if you can find, um other sources to to kind of back up your thing so you know if it's an environmental if ecology north can come out and be like i don't know the the city's right and blah 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 or you know so and so else uh just to try to bump up the but you're never gonna win against the keyboard warriors and you just have to like the proof is in the pudding i think Strategic Steps works with local municipalities, boards, and school divisions across Canada, providing guidance and expertise in governance, strategy, and sustainability. They work with clients to build on existing strengths, develop recommendations that are practical, sustainable, and strategic, and lead professional development sessions that drive organizational excellence and council and board member growth. From strategic planning to organizational and governance reviews to governance workshops and more, Strategic Steps has the tools, experience, and expertise to help your organization reach its goals and set itself up for future success. To book a consultation or learn more about Strategic Steps Incorporated, visit strategicsteps.ca today. I want to turn to my last segment here before we wrap up because I'm cautious of time and I just realized that we're at the 40 minute mark and I'm going to try and make this as quick as possible for you if you have five minutes. And I want to turn to tourism. With our show, we have a very large following for some reason in Central Canada. We are the Alberta show, but we have very fo- uh, large following in Central Alberta and Ireland and Germany. Thank you, Ireland and Germany, but here we are. So if I was a tourist coming to the city of Yellowknife tomorrow, if I was making a plan for this winter or next summer to come visit your community, what are the unique gems as a tourist that I should automatically put on my tourist itinerary for the city of Yellowknife? Well, that's easy. Uh, so we're the, the best place to see the Northern Lights in the world. If you come for 
three days, you have a 90% chance of seeing the Northern Lights. And the season is about um, mid-August to about end of October, and then kind of beginning again in January all the way till the end of March. Um, and the Northern Lights are spectacular. The great thing about August is it's, it's pretty warm, so you can stay out for long periods and watch them. Uh, but March is great because we have a snow castle. And so it's this big structure and, you know, the, the roof isn't covered. So you can see the Northern Lights while listening to this band on a Friday night and partying on the lake. Um, and then, you know, the next day you might get up and drive the ice road from Yellowknife over to Tedetta, and which is the little indigenous community across the, the way from us. Uh, and you could go ice fishing. In the summer, we've got 24 hour daylight. So you could go fishing or golfing you're, and- You're that high up that you have 24 yeah. hour daylight? Yeah. Ooh. The best time I think is June 21st. It's National Indigenous Peoples Day. And we do great, there's great festiv festivities that happen. So there's this amazing fish fry right in City Hall's um, lawn and uh, the North Slave Métis Alliance put on this great show. And um, then there's a great music fest in, in July, Folk on the Rocks. So there's also our golf course, very climate change friendly. There's no grass, it's all sand. Um, so you can come play 18 holes in a, a sand <laughs> okay yeah yeah you carry around this little mat and you you put the ball on it and you tee off it um well, so the first a, time i went golfing on grass was different as a as a golfer who hasn't gotten out in the last few years because of covid i can tell you you have just got my june 21st 22nd and 23rd all booked up for next year i will be up there for that indigenous day and also uh around the golf and i will take you out mayor and i will bring you for 18 18 holes um, there we go june 21st is the big um uh midnight golf tournament too so let's do it you know. mark i'm marking yeah. in my calendars right now i'm taking uh, the mayor of yellow knife <laughs> midnight golfing game on <laughs> but i want to end on this question and that is and you can take as long as you want to answer this or you can take a pause and answer this if you want but what makes the city of yellow knife such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family i think it's the the balance of what i quote unquote, call urban and nature, you know, so I could be having sushi or like amazing Ethiopian, we've got the best Ethiopian restaurant in Yellowknife, um, having that for lunch, and then like, you know, a five minute walk later, you're in nature, you're all by yourself, or you're out for paddleboard in the summer, or, you know, skiing in the winter, um, a great sense of community, and again, you know, referencing my mom at the beginning is like, if you want to create something, it's, the, it's, you give your idea to a few other people and they're like, yeah, I could help you with that. So um, really inclusive and there's, I think I sleep a little bit in January, but the rest of the year is just nonstop uh, different activities and lots to do and, and great employment opportunities. Like if you want to, you know, as an intern, you're also right in there, not just fetching coffees like I see in the movies. Wow. Well, uh, Your Worship, I want to thank you so much for this last 50 minutes of conversation. This has been an honor and pleasure to have you on the show, but also talk to your talk to you about you and your community. And now I have a plan for June of next year, which I did not expect to have this before I <laughs> went into this interview. But next year is the year that I'm going to try and take the show on the road and do some more shows on the road. So I will try to come up and no, I'm not trying to come up because I've been to Northwest Territories once. I drove in and I drove back out just because I want to say that I've been to the Northwest Territory. There you go. Well, and Chris, there's like baby bison at the beginning of June. You could go out to where MP McLeod's from, Fort Providence. There's there's just so much to do. Yeah. The baby I'm, bison are a cute season. Yes, I'm looking forward to it then. Uh, but uh, Your Worship, thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. No problem. Thanks for having me. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your social media feed for at least five minutes a day. 
go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our democracy, it helps our society, and it helps us be a better people at the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews Municipal Month. We will be back tomorrow with Montreal City, sorry, Montreal Borough Councilor. I want to make sure I get that right here. Uh, Kayleen uh, Monroe, I, I paused on her name there for a second and so please tune into that because it's going to be another fascinating episode so with that have yourself an excellent day and remember everyone keep talking